before. Um, if you're taking notes, then you have to listen very carefully. We're not going to have the uh, words on the screen until we get it fixed. It's just not fixed. And uh, really, please make that a matter of prayer because we're kind of at an impasse. We don't know what else to do. Uh, don't know of a professional that we can call in to repair this, but we can't halfway do it. And so uh, let's listen carefully today and, uh, uh, and take notes and uh, take these homes and hope home and study them yourself. And Second um, Peter chapter 1 verse 3 where Paul just read, look there in your Bible. And you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 3 also and put a marker there because we'll get back to Ephesians chapter number 3. Um, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature, that is, being a child of God in the family of God, having his nature like a child has the nature of their parents, having escaped the corruption that's in the world, through lust, having escaped, is a continuous action. That is, it does not have to have a hold upon us. The attractions of the world around us doesn't have to have a hold upon us as followers of Jesus Christ, as his children. But uh, the subject of that passage is the power that God has given to us. In our 40 days of prayer this past week, uh, I believe it was on Friday, we were reminded of our need for God's power to accomplish anything for that matter, but especially in respect to a revitalization, uh, revival taking place. It must come from God. It isn't something that we can work up on our own in some kind of emotional frenzy and make it happen. It isn't something that we can use um, man's tools to accomplish. Uh, revival only takes place when, when God is working, when He is working in His people. That's the only time it takes place. You can, you can make it look like a big show, but it isn't real revival until God is working in the hearts of His people, us. Parent, prayer acknowledges something. Uh, whenever you pray, what you're saying in action is, I'm totally dependent upon you, God. I can't do this. We need a power that's outside of ourselves to do the will of God. If you will, look at Ephesians chapter 3 and... Here we'll find our text, and the, the title of this message is Praying for Power. Last week, the message was an example of power. How when the people prayed in Acts chapter 4, the, the, the place that they literally were sitting in shook like an earthquake. It wasn't just a, uh, uh, an accident. It was a public display of God's power. It was God saying, I approve of this. I am in this. And I hope that as you pray for your church, that you would specifically be praying that God would work in our church. That we would see His power on display. Ephesians 3 verse 14 is a literal prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed. It's a prayer for believers. It's a prayer which touches on things that are essential for the Christian life. And as I was reading that, I realized that if Paul prayed this for the saints, the Christians, and the church at Ephesus, then I think it applies to us too. 
as a New Testament church. The focus of this prayer is on how to know and live by the power of God. It's the challenge for us as believers. We're so used to doing it all on our own power, in our own strength, with our, with our own wisdom, with our own intelligence. And yet for real revival to break out, we have to come to the place where we acknowledge, God, I can't do this. Before stepping in this pulpit this morning when I was standing right there and Paul was praying, I said, God, I can't do this. I really can't. Today is just not a good day. Walked in the door, everything just doesn't work right. It's frustrating. All I can think of is what we can't do. And the devil is working hard. And I was standing right there and praying, God, I can't do this. I, I don't have the words to say. And so I'm praying that He will do this, that He will speak to you today, that you will know His heart and His desire for you and for your church. Most of the time we don't pray until we're desperate. Would you agree? I'm desperate. So, as we read verses 14 and 19, the first point in the message, if you're taking notes, is, hey, this prayer is for you. Verse 14. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened, with might, power, by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. As we look at His prayer for us, we notice that there are really four requests that Paul makes in this prayer for us. This prayer is for you. The first one is found in verse 16, where Paul prays to God that He would grant you, us, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. Now here Paul is praying that we might have strength. Do you need strength? I think we all do. We need strength. Paul desires that God would answer, he says, according to the riches of His glory. Now notice, Paul does not want the answer to come out of God's riches, but according to God's riches. You say, well, that, why, is, why is that important? Well, Paul does, doesn't want us to experience something from God, some of God's power, but he wants us to experience the limitless supply of God himself according to his riches. Not out of his riches, but according to his riches. He prays that we might be strengthened according to the riches of God. And then the place where we're to be strengthened is the inner man. The inner man. And then the source of this power is given through a person. The Spirit of God. Now don't be afraid of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is God. <laughs> He's God. The Holy Spirit is God. The third person of the Trinity God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're three in one. They're all the same. That's the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not some kind of a spooky ghost that just comes in and overtakes the crowd and makes people jump up and down and, and talk in strange languages and stuff like that. The Holy Ghost is God. He is a person, not a thing, not an it, not a presence, not a power. He's a person. 
And he says, we're supposed to be strengthened on the inner man through the person of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how do, I, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? Well, if you're saved, if you know you're saved, then you know you have the Holy Spirit. Because he's a person. You don't have some of a person. You have all of a person, right? You either have him or you don't have him. Some people look at the Holy Spirit, you know, thinking like, well, I can have some of the Holy Spirit, but not all the Holy Spirit. I'm praying for the fullness of the Holy Spirit so that I can get more of the Holy Spirit. But in reality, he is a person. You either have him or you don't. You don't have some of a person, do you? You have all of a person. So if you're saved today, if you're genuinely born again, the Bible says, it's not my bright idea, the Bible says that you have the Spirit of God living in you right now. The same Holy Spirit, by the way, that indwelled the people in Acts chapter 4, the people that prayed and the place shook around them, the powerful prayer that we saw last week, the same Holy Spirit. Is the one who prompted that and who empowered those believers, many of them, to lay down their life for Christ. So we pray that God would give us power in the inner man through that Holy Spirit that lives in us. The moment a person is saved, he receives all the Holy Spirit that he will ever receive. From that moment on, the question becomes, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? You hear people talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what that means? To be filled means to be controlled by. To be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It, it's a thing of us following Him where He leads us. Us obeying Him as he convicts us, as he leads us. Uh, he was never meant to be something that was confusing. That's something that Satan has done. The Holy Spirit is God, living in the, the hearts of believers. And as we live in obedience to him, his word, his leading, then we are being filled with the Holy Spirit. The evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that others see God in us. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, those are the things that the Holy Spirit does. Love, peace, joy, comfort, all those fruits that you read about in Galatians, those are the fruit of the Spirit. That's what happens when you're being led by the Spirit, when you're being controlled by Him. But then the prayer is that He would dwell in our hearts. What does that mean? To dwell. Uh, well, one meaning would be to live. We know he lives there. But to dwell means to be at home or to be welcome there. In other words, Christ desires to settle down and be at home in our hearts. In fact, the word translated dwell is a compound form of two Greek words, kata and oikos. Kata means down and oikos means house. Settle down. Christ wants to settle down in our house. He wants to dwell in our hearts through faith. A fellow by the name of Robert Munger once wrote a little booklet entitled, My Heart, Christ's Home. And in that booklet, he pictures the Christian life as a house. Jesus enters the house and he goes from room to room where he's surprised to find many things which he was uncomfortable with. It was hard for him to dwell there because of these things he saw. He goes into the library of the mind and begins to clean up the trash that he finds there. He replaces the trash with his word. He enters into the dining room of the appetite and he finds many sinful desires listed on the worldly menu. He replaces things like materialism, envy, pride, and lust with humility, love, meekness, and the like. 
He enters the living room of fellowship and there he finds worldly companions and activities. In the workshop, only toys are being made. In the closet, many hidden sins are kept. Christ could only feel comfortable after he had cleaned every room. Only then could he settle down and be at home. So when we pray and we ask the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts, what we're saying is, Lord, we want you to feel comfortable in our life. We know that you're there, but we want you to feel comfortable in our life, to dwell with us. In order for Christ to dwell in our hearts, our hearts must dwell on Him. And our faith must cause us to be faithful to Him and be honest when we see the things in our life that are displeasing to Him and, and forsake them and ask God to forgive us for those things that distract us from our relationship with Him. Whatever you give your life to is what your heart dwells on. Prayer has been called the window of the soul. What we pray for is normally what we care for. We all pray for what concerns us. And the reverse is also true. What we don't pray about, normally, we don't care about. And that's a solemn and convicting thought. We can say all... All of us, that we, we can say that, that something means a lot to us, but if we never bring it before God in prayer, then we really can't say we care about it. Prayer should not be a last resort. Would you agree? It shouldn't. It shouldn't be the only, you know, well, we've got to better pray now. We've tried everything else, so we better pray now. It shouldn't be seen that way. But it is. In a lot of cases, it is. What we pray about, though, is reflective of what we care about. One purpose in this 40 days of prayer is so that every day, if you're doing this, that every day you'll be reminded to pray for your church. That you'll be reminded to pray for your community, your neighbors that you'll be reminded to be in touch with God every day. There's a third request that he makes here. And it continues in verse 17. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. One great result of being strengthened by the Spirit in the inner man is that you'll have a growing understanding of the love of Christ. It says we're supposed to be rooted and grounded in love. And God desires that our roots run deep when it comes to love. He desires that our foundation is strong. We were planted in love. You realize that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did, you know, what was it that prompted him to even send his son to die on the cross? It was his great love for us who at that point didn't even acknowledge him. He loved us even while we were yet sinners going our own way. He loved us while we didn't even acknowledge who he was. He loved us before we were ever born and He sent His Son to die for us on the cross. His love is so immense. When you're rooted and grounded in that kind of love, it gives such a great stability. Even when you go through a torturous trial, you realize that God isn't doing this to you because He hates you. He loves you. And there's some loving purpose for what you're having to go through. You know that He's not going to turn His back or run away and leave you when everybody else forsakes you because He loves you. If you're rooted and grounded in that love, you can withstand anything. When He prays that we might comprehend this love, He's praying that we might understand it, not just intellectually, but experientially. He prays that this might bring us to a place of understanding by experience. 
the breadth and length and height and depth of his love. The only way we can begin to understand that is to experience it ourselves. A lot of people in this world today are doing a lot of crazy things to find love. Uh, love is redefined almost every day. <laughs> There's so many people who don't feel loved. They feel very lonely. Some have never really experienced love. But there's one who wants to love us so immensely, so deeply. And he talks about that, the the breadth of God's love. It's immense. It reaches to all nations, all men, all sinners, every need, every care, every situation. His love intercedes. The length of God's love. How long is He going to love us? Eternally. Forever. Do you know anybody in this world that loves you with that kind of love? The depth of God's love is unfathomable. It causes God to stoop as low as a man is. He reached down to us. The height of God's love is infinite. In His love we ascend with Christ in victory, joy, truth, character, and and love. You only really know what love is when you have a relationship with Him. Paul also prays that we we would know the unknowable. He prays for us to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Verse 19 says, And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. When I read this passage, I was reminded of the words of a song that we sing here once in a while. You may not know where this song was written um, is simply called The Love of God. The words of the song were written by a prisoner named Friedrich Lehmann. And he wrote the verse of this song on the walls of his prison cell. It says, Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. The love of God. You know that song? Prisoner wrote that. I would think a prisoner would have a tendency many times to think that they were unloved. No family to visit them. Only enemies in prison. It would be very easy to think that way. Nobody loves me. I suppose a prisoner would have much time to think and pray and dwell on things eternal. And I'm glad that God was able to reach him there in that prison cell. I don't know who else used, God used to get him, you know, to get him to hear about the gospel, to hear about the, the love of God. But I realize that there are people that are free as a bird physically, but they still are in a prison. They're in a prison of their own fears doubts, experiences. They feel great loneliness. They need to know that God loves them with such an immense love. A love that's eternal, that's never going to fade away. A love that's it's so deep that a human mind can't understand it. That's the kind of love that He has for you. And then the final prayer request is found in verse 19 where Paul prays that you might be filled up with all the fullness of God. 
Paul is praying that we might be filled with God. He's really praying that we might contain the uncontainable. It is a great privilege of the believer. We've been created to be a container of God. Everywhere we go, He goes with us. The Holy Spirit is God, right? Where does He live? He lives in us. The Bible calls the body the temple of the Holy Ghost. He lives in us. So wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we say, He's with us. We may not acknowledge Him, but He's with us. We contain God. If you're saved, He desires to pour His life into us and to fill us to the fullest. It's the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The greatest need for the believer is to be filled with Christ. To be controlled by Him, by His nature, by His character. Those are the requests that Paul prayed for the believers in Ephesus. And I believe they're applicable to us today to have the power to be strengthened like we need to be strengthened. We're all weak, very weak. But there's the power within us. And that's the third point if you're taking notes. The four requests for which Paul has prayed can very easily seem beyond our reach. And indeed they are. Unless God intervenes to enable us to reach these goals, we're going to fail. And so Paul closes with this famous benediction, which reveals the power available to us through an able Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember the little chorus, God is able. God is able. God is able. God, yes, He is able. My God is able to carry you through. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know it myself. I know the chorus, but I don't remember the words this morning. But God is able, and that comes from the uh, verse in verse 20. Uh, now unto Him that is able to do. Uh, now the word do is a verb. It's an action verb, Right? Now I want you to notice how many adverbs are mentioned. You know what an adverb is? An adverb modifies the verb. So an adverb says something about the verb do. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. He uses four adverbs to, dis to describe what God can do. It says he is able to do exceeding. Now, in most conversations, that would be enough, wouldn't it? Exceeding. But then he goes on to say abundantly. That's, that's even more than exceedingly. And then above, above all, all is all. It includes everything. It's a reminder of, the, of what God can do in your life, in my life, in our church. It says, according to the power that worketh in us. And then he goes on to say, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end God is able the personal application is to be made here when you're weak pray to be strengthened in the inner man inside it's a prayer that God will always answer I think about Nehemiah when he was so broken over the walls that had fallen around Jerusalem and hadn't been rebuilt and how his heart was so touched by that that he just sat down and wept. And then he prayed about this for four months. 
We think 40 days is a long time. For four months, he prayed that God would help him raise up those walls again. And then the day finally came when he stood before the king. And the king could tell something was bothering him. His countenance was different. And the king says, what's up, Nehemiah? And the Bible says, Nehemiah did what? He prayed. Now, he didn't have time to pray, pray one of those long Our Father prayers. It was something like, God help. God give me strength. God give me strength. And then he opened his mouth, realizing that if he said the wrong thing, he could lose his head. And he shared the burden that God had, been, had, been, had given him. It had been on his heart for... For four months, he shared that with the most powerful man in the world at that time. And God answered his prayer. Because the king saw what God was doing in Nehemiah's life. And the king gave him favor. And God made it possible because the king gave him things that he could never buy himself. I mean, really, think about if you were Nehemiah and you wanted to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and they were all laying there in trash and the walls were being burned and all you had was your job, the king's cupbearer. You didn't have great resources. In fact, you're just a human you're just one person. But God placed you in a position where you could literally have the ear of the most powerful person in the world. But he had to have boldness and courage to speak the truth, even if it was risky. Even, even if it meant taking a risk. And you know, that, that's what faith is about. It's about taking a risk. Only you're not risking when you place your faith in the Lord because he won't let you down and he didn't let him down and he won't let us down you know why because he's able when we can't he can so as you pray this prayer ask God for three things ask him that Christ might be at home in your heart Jesus I want you to be at home in my heart Show me if there's anything in the way. Something that needs to go. If it's an attitude. If it's a habit. Whatever it is, show me what needs to go. And I'll take steps to rid my life of this thing. Um, ask God in your prayer to give you an, a growing comprehension of His love. And then finally, as you pray, pray for the fullness of God in your life. God, I want all of you. I want you to have all of me. Everything that I have is yours. All that I can do is yours. My time is yours. My talents and abilities are yours. My treasure, all of it, is yours. I have nothing that I haven't received. You've given it all to me because you love me. And now, right now, I trust you, God, the one who can do all things because you're able to use me to do your work here that you might be glorified in our community. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much today for the privilege we have to pray. Lord, when we can't, when we feel like we can't, we know that you can. And I pray you might encourage us, Father, to dwell on the truth of your word, not on the lies of Satan. Help us to move forward in faith that you're going to do great things through us. Father, help us to be honest and 
allow the Spirit of God to deal with our sins, the things that need to be rid from our lives. Give us courage and boldness to take a step of faith. What may seem like a risk, but it isn't when we're placing our faith in you because you never let us down. I pray you lead us and guide us today as we seek to make application of this message to our lives. Lord, you're, I know that you're doing something in all of our lives. We all have our different um, uh, issues, our different challenges, and we need help, we need wisdom, and more importantly, we need your strength. Give us that strength. Help us to find it in you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.